Hi, welcome to Gecko Online. In this lesson, we'll talk about food and how what we choose to eat affects not only our health, but the health of the planet. For those of us who are lucky enough to get three meals a day, we'll eat about 100,000 meals each in our lifetimes. That makes our choice of what to eat one of the most far-reaching decisions we can make. So let's take a closer look at those three meals and figure out where they come from, the impacts along the way, and how we can make better choices for ourselves and for the planet. Most of us don't really even need to think very hard about where our food comes from. The store, the restaurant, okay, the farm if you insist. But for most of human history, nearly everyone had to think about where food came from. That was their job. 95% of society revolved around food and its production, leaving 5% for everything else. But the way we produce food now actually flips those numbers around, leaving very little concern about how we get our food, but just that we can afford to eat it. While we were looking the other way, food production changed and our diets changed with it. Traditional diets and farming methods that sustained our health and environment for generations are now being replaced with processed foods and factory farming. On top of that, we have to produce a lot more food than before to feed the extra 5 billion people added to the population in the last century. Because of the changes in our food production and the sheer amounts we have to produce, we are causing negative impacts on our health, environment, and society as a whole. Our food system is unsustainable, complex, and layered. So let's go ahead and just start the first meal of the day with breakfast. It doesn't matter whether you prefer to eat eggs, meat, cereal, rice, bread. All of this food today originally comes from grain. And that even includes the eggs and the meat, as chickens, pigs, and cows are usually these days raised on diets of grain. In our century, the population doubled and tripled, and that meant we needed to start producing a lot more food. We did that by developing remarkable technologically advanced farming systems with the ability to produce huge amounts of grain in really short growth periods. The U.S. has actually become the leader in these technologies and is the world's biggest producer, growing 40% of the world's corn. Fields of corn are grown and used for human, animal, and even industrial consumption. That means corn is no longer just the corn on your plate. It's used to do things like produce ethanol, lipstick, sealant, tires, high fructose syrup, and hundreds of other products that are exported globally. Due to all the fertilizers and pesticides to make the corn grow, we're actually killing all the tiny microorganisms needed to keep the soil healthy. And this is a system that is now being adopted in fast developing nations like China and India. All this production matters because it's you eating that egg, bacon, or cereal for breakfast. You, the consumer, eats food grown in poor soil. It's logical that poor soil produces nutrient deficient crops, and that can only produce nutrient-deficient people. Because we're moving further and further from our true source of food and adding preservatives and additives to allow them to sit on shelves before we buy them, we're actually making the matter even worse. So can we even avoid all these problems, maybe just by not eating breakfast? Absolutely not. It's the most important meal giving you energy for the day. But it's what you choose in the morning that can make a difference. You might consider eating fresh local fruits and maybe avoiding as many packaged breakfast items as you can. Okay, so now it's lunchtime. You're probably sitting in the office and thinking, hmm, what could be a fast and healthy lunch option? Let's say you choose a tomato salad, thinking that's good for your body and the environment. But have you ever asked yourself where that tomato comes from? Chances are it's from a place similar to Almira, Spain, home of the Almira tomato. Much like the corn grown all over the U.S., Almira has become one of the highest yielding environments for genetically modified greenhouse tomatoes. Although it all sounds very unnatural, it is a technology globally used among agriculturalists in Greece, Canada, and America, growing in over 100,000 acres of soilless greenhouses all year round, even though tomatoes are summer fruit. And why is that even happening? Well, there's three things. One, the economies of scale. The more tomatoes that are produced, the cheaper and more competitive their prices on the market. Two, enormous quantities, because people from all over the world want to eat tomatoes at any time of year. And three, people's changes in diets to create this kind of demand. This is not only the case for tomatoes, but most produce that has been carefully studied, groomed, and altered by scientists to create outperforming species of fruit or vegetable that wipes out any desire to harvest an inferior crop. So the more we domesticate different fruits and vegetables to be grown out of season in modified measures that even destroy the soil, whole ecosystems will suffer by taking over from a job that was once in nature's hands. That lunchtime juicy tomato that you thought was healthy could be coming from somewhere very far away. Therefore, it was still unripe when harvested, 
and has lost up to 90% of its nutritional value by the time it reaches your plate. That's why it's important to learn about where the food we order in a restaurant or buy from the shelves in supermarkets comes from. As consumers, we have the right to ask and be informed. That brings us to snack time. Isn't it amazing that we've fallen into this idea that food is a pleasurable fuel to satisfy cravings or relieve stress rather than nutrients that inspire and feed our system? Things like french fries, small sugary milk chocolates, ice cream, candies, these are all great as we know, but they have about a zero nutritional value. Yet we've seen fast food chains and packaged good companies owning more territory globally than most former historical empires. They even have the proclamation of billions and billions served. Food is now marketed based on its alluring value towards satisfying emotional needs and new occasions to eat something that your body doesn't really need. In fact, the top food companies are supporting the development of food substances that look better, are produced faster, but give us consumers very little nutritional value. Pay attention to your next visit to the grocery store. All those colorful variants of the same food, packaged differently, even if they're labeled with things like low-carb, healthy, fat-free, or natural, they're there to seduce your cravings rather than feed you with nutritional goodness as whole foods do. We as a consumer have the responsibility towards our bodies and our health to learn more about the food we put into our systems rather than settle for convenience or image. To counter the fast food movement, Carla Petrini started the slow food movement in 1986, promoting good, clean, fair food for all. He protested outside the Vatican against the way fast food was infringing upon the very fabric of Italian society. And today, it's becoming a global movement from places like San Francisco to Shanghai. Another movement was started by famous chef Jamie Oliver in the UK. He used media attention to draw interest to food issues. In 2004, motivated by the poor state of school meals in the UK, Jamie actually went back to school with the aim of educating and motivating the community to enjoy cooking and eating healthy, nutritious lunches, rather than the processed foods they were used to. He launched a national campaign on and offline called Feed Me Better and petitioned for better school meals. Both of these initiatives are trying to bring awareness and appreciation for food that every individual, family, local, and even national government can take in order to bring about a more sustainable food system. And they all started with one person. That brings us to the last portion of our lesson, dinner. How about a steak? Did you know that meat consumption worldwide has increased almost three times in the last 50 years? The average U.S. citizen now consumes over 100 kilos of meat per year. In China, the change in a traditionally vegetable-based diet is even more dramatic. The average person 30 years ago only ate 16 kilos of meat per year. Today, that number has more than tripled. We used to assume that the more meat we ate, the healthier and stronger our bodies would be. But is this really true? The best evidence we have actually comes from the China study. For 20 years, they tracked people's eating habits and their health, looking for the connection between the two. They found that people who ate more meat were far more likely to suffer from heart disease, diabetes, and cancer than people who ate mostly plants. In China, people have been thriving for centuries on traditional plant-based diets. And as China has gotten richer, you'd expect that health would improve. But in fact, China's Minister of Health said recently that the number one social problem was that of obesity and diabetes. And it's not just China. As traditional diets in developing countries get replaced with diets rich in sugar and meat, their rates of diabetes are projected to double within the next two decades. But it's not just our health that's suffering. It's the animals in the environment, too. When we think of farms, we picture cows grazing in green, open fields. But actually, the reality is we've started raising animals in a very different way. Thousands of cows are packed together in feedlots, unable to move around. Instead of grass, which their stomachs are specially designed for, we feed them corn and soy, which they can't digest properly. To keep them from dying in these conditions and to make them grow three times faster than normal, we pump them full of growth hormones and antibiotics. The environment suffers too. Since we need all kinds of space to grow the corn and soy that gives the cows indigestion, we don't have any extra space, so we cut down the rainforest to get it. Clearing land for growing animal feed is already the number one cause of tropical deforestation. As if that wasn't bad enough with what all those cows are eating, their bodies are actually producing methane, a greenhouse gas 20 times as strong as CO2. When you add that to all the greenhouse gases we release growing all that feed, 
It turns out that raising livestock produces a fifth of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. That's more greenhouse gases than all the world's cars, jets, trains, ships, buses, and trucks put together. So does that mean we all need to become vegetarians? Not quite. Most of us like eating meat and aren't about to give it up. But a diet with less meat in it will be better off for your health and that of the environment. So maybe try a meatless day or two each week and explore other plant-based protein options. You might realize you don't miss meat that much and want to give vegetarianism a try. We're at a point in time where the power of choice and the educated opinion of enough citizens globally can start dictating a new definition and new politics of food. Instead of just eating what corporations put in front of us, we can make our own choices about what we eat. And there's a power in our choices on how that food is made, where it comes from, and how it's produced. Supporting a system that provides nutritious food will bring you optimal health. Nature gives us all the energy and nutrients we need in its simplest form. We need to realize the power of choice we have and create new solutions to make this natural system work so that our three meals a day will not only sustain our bodies, but also our planet and society.